Hereditary information is encoded in the chemical language of DNA. In this lecture, we will review the structure of DNA and find out how it is replicated. Do you remember which monomers compose nucleic acids such as DNA? Yes, nucleotides, which are composed of a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And if you will recall, the pentose sugar has an orientation based on its carbons. The 3' prime carbon and the 5' prime carbon are on opposite sides of the nucleotide molecule. The 5' prime carbon is closest to the nucleotide's phosphate group. And to form nucleic acids, we have to connect these monomers together. The bond that forms between the nucleotides is a covalent bond specifically called a phosphodiester bond. It occurs between the pentose sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate of another nucleotide. The sugar and phosphate form the sugar phosphate backbone of the nucleic acid. The bases are not part of the backbone and can form bonds with other nucleic acid strands. Nucleic acid strands, such as DNA, run in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction based on the sugar orientation. DNA is double stranded, so the other strand must run in the opposite direction for the bases to properly interact. We say the strands run anti parallel to one another. There are four different types of nucleotides based on what kind of nitrogenous base they have. We commonly call different nucleotides bases. Adenine and guanine have nitrogenous bases that are purines. Purines have two rings. Adenine has no oxygen attached to its rings, while guanine does. Thymine and cytosine have nitrogenous bases that are pyrimidines. Pyrimidines have only one ring. Thymine has two oxygens attached to its ring, while cytosine has only one. These bases compare with each other, but only in very specific combinations according to Chargraff's rule. Chargraff discovered that DNA contained the same amount of adenine as thymine and the same amount of guanine as cytosine. He concluded that adenine paired with thymine and guanine paired with cytosine. This is due to a few reasons. The first is spacing. A purine-purine pair would be too wide and couldn't bind due to the overlap. Two pyrimidines would not come close enough to each other to form bonds. But a purine-pyrimidine pair is just right to form bonds. And what are those bonds? Hydrogen bonds. But these are also specific. Adenine and thymine form two hydrogen bonds, while guanine and cytosine form three. So an incorrect pairing would not form the correct number of hydrogen bonds, and it would have the wrong spacing. Exactly how does the phosphodiester bond between nucleotides form? In reality, the nucleotides used to build DNA have three phosphate groups. These molecules are called deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, or DNTPSs. The N stands for the base and can be adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. Notice how this molecule looks similar to ATP due to the three phosphates. That is because it is similar. The multiple phosphates on the molecule store energy in their bonds, just like ATP. Forming a phosphodiester bond is an intergonic reaction. When a DNPT is added to DNA, the second and third phosphates are cleaved from the molecule. There is a release of energy, which is used to form that phosphodiester bond. Please be aware that while DNA is frequently presented in this latter diagram, with the two antiparallel sugar phosphate backbones as the sides and the nitrogenous bases as the rungs, the molecule is really twisted into a double helix, and the phosphates, sugars, and bases are really composed of atoms. So this space filling model shows a more realistic relationship of the positions of the atoms in the DNA molecule. However, we will be using the latter diagram in most representations. You learned in the very first unit that DNA carried information in the cell. So how does it do that? Well, information is encoded in the nucleotide sequence. A wide variety of information can be encoded because the four different nucleotides can be used for each space in the DNA instructions. For example, if we just looked at a 10 nucleotide sequence, we could place one of four nucleotides in each of those 10 spots, resulting in over 1 million different possible combinations. But organisms contain much more than 10 nucleotides in their genomes. If we look at humans, we find over 3 billion base pairs. The possible combinations would be 4 with an exponent to 3 billion. Now, in reality, 
Not all those nucleotides code for cellular products, but it is still a jaw-dropping number of combinations. Scientists determine that DNA replication is semi-conservative. This means that when a DNA molecule replicates, an old and new strand make up the two new DNA molecules. We call the old strand the parental strand. Bacterial chromosomes have single origins of replication, so the parent strands are separated at one origin and the new nucleotides are added to both parent strands in opposite directions. Remember, nucleotides are always added in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The last nucleotide added will butt up against the first, and we have two new DNA molecules. But eukaryotic chromosomes have multiple origins of replication. Remember, eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, and these replication bubbles will eventually merge and produce two new linear chromosomes. So let's investigate DNA replication in detail. The DNA is really in a helix, but we will portray it in the latter diagram for simplicity. The first thing that occurs in DNA replication is the separation of the parent strands by breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the bases together. This is accomplished by an enzyme called DNA helicase. The unzipped region directly behind the helicase is called the replication fork. This diagram just shows a portion of the replication bubble. Remember, there are many bubbles along the linear chromosome. As helicase unzips the DNA, the double helix in front of the helicase coils tighter and tighter. Topoisomerase is an enzyme that cuts and rejoins the DNA so it doesn't get too twisted. And single-stranded binding proteins hold the two strands apart so that the hydrogen bonds between the bases don't reform. The two strands of the helix that were just separated are called parent or template strands, as these will be used to synthesize the new strands. The enzyme primase initially adds a short sequence of RNA nucleotides. This must occur because the enzyme that adds DNA nucleotides, DNA polymerase 3, can only add a nucleotide to an existing nucleotide. Like this one, the primer will be replaced with DNA nucleotides later. Here's DNA polymerase 3. It is the enzyme that adds DNA nucleotides in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction to create the leading strand, which is continuously added toward the replication fork. And here's DNA polymerase 1, which will replace the primer with DNA nucleotides. One new strand has been added, but what about the other strand? Well, that one must be added a little differently. Again, primase must add the primer. And DNA polymerase 3 adds the DNA nucleotides, but it cannot add them towards the replication fork. Remember, it can only add them in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, so it has to add them away from the replication fork. That means that this strand, called the lagging strand, must be added in segments. And even though DNA polymerase 3 adds nucleotides away from the replication fork, the next segment will be added closer to the replication fork. These segments of the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase 1 replaces the primers with DNA nucleotides, and an enzyme called ligase joins the Okazaki fragments of the lagging strand together. It does this by forming phosphodiester bonds to connect the sugar phosphate backbones of the fragments, and this continues until the linear chromosome has been completely replicated. In reality, all those enzymes form what is called the replosome, which moves as one big unit during DNA replication. In order for this to occur, the lacking strand and its parent strand must form a loop near the replication fork so that all the enzymes of the replosome can progress in the same direction. The only reason why the two parent strands can be copied to produce two identical DNA strands is because of the base pairing rules. As long as we know one strand of the DNA molecule, we can always figure out the complementary strand. Take a look at this strand. Can you figure out what the complementary strand would be? Of course you can. And because DNA polymerase adds complementary bases per the base pairing rules, semi-conservative replication works like a charm. The parent strands are used as templates to produce two identical DNA molecules. Here's an overview of DNA replication. The DNA molecules consist of two complementary strands of DNA held together by hydrogen bonds between the bases. The strands twist around to form a double helix. 
During replication, the two strands of the parental DNA double helix separate. Which enzymes break those hydrogen bonds? Yes, DNA helicase. Free nucleotides that are complementary to those in each strand are joined to make new daughter strands. Which enzyme does this? Yes, DNA polymerase 3. And what are those new daughter strands called? Yes, the leading and the lagging strands. Each parental strand in its new daughter strand form a new double helix. But we have a replication problem concerning the ends of the chromosome. The three prime ends of the parent strands are the problem. As you can see in this diagram, the leading strand is added all the way to the end by DNA polymerase 3 in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction. However, the lagging strand has to have a primer at the end for DNA polymerase 3 to add nucleotides 5 prime to 3 prime. The problem is that DNA polymerase 1 cannot replace the primer with DNA nucleotides as the enzyme must have existing nucleotides to form phosphodiester bonds with the 3 prime end. The primer degrades and the end of the new strand is shorter than the parent strand and this shortening occurs each time the DNA is replicated. DNA contains the instructions for the cell. How can it just disappear? Well, because the ends of the linear chromosomes do not contain functional genes, but sections of nucleotides called telomeres. The telomeres consist of a repeated sequence containing thymine, adenine, and guanine. Telomeres protect the functional DNA as the telomere sections can shorten and no genes are damaged. But eventually, cells will divide so many times that the telomeres disappear. This means that the cells have a lifespan. Well, some cells. Other cells have an enzyme called telomerase, which can rebuild the telomeres. This enzyme has a built-in RNA nucleotide sequence that is complementary to the tag sequences of the telomere. It attaches to the three prime end of the chromosome and extends it by adding more DNA nucleotides. Then a primer can be added and DNA polymerase 3 can add DNA nucleotides to the complementary strand. Human gametocytes and many cancer cells have functioning telomerase. Replication seems like a complicated process, huh? It is, and therefore, errors can happen. DNA polymerase mismatches a nucleotide in about every 100,000 base pairs, but it has a secret weapon. A subunit called epsilon will stop the enzyme and correct the mistake most of the time, but it cannot fix everything. So in a human's 3 billion base pairs, a mistake goes uncorrected about once every billion base pairs added, and other problems can occur. DNA can just begin to break down due to age, or become damaged by certain chemicals in UV light. UV light can form what is called thymine dimers, in which adjacent thymine bases will bind together. This forms a lump in the chromosome, and repair enzymes will excise that section of nucleotides. The correct nucleotides will be added, and the sugar phosphate backbone rejoined.